It gladdens my heart that I've been asked to share my thoughts with you on a subject that has remained evergreen throughout the ages, the subject of leadership. Throughout the ages, men have asked, how do we lead ourselves into what we desire? Throughout the ages, Men and women have sought to improve their circumstances through leaders. Throughout the ages, leaders of one kind or another have emerged. Throughout the ages, the subject of leadership has been interrogated. And it doesn't matter which civilization one is talking about. Leadership is at the very heart of the affairs of man. If you look at any of the holy books, the question of leadership is one that is at the very heart of it. Those of you who are assembled here who are Christians will remember the many times that the question of leadership has come to the fore. Many of you have read the story of great leaders in the Bible, such as Abraham, such as Moses, such as David, and many others. Those of you who are familiar with other civilizations will also recognize that leadership has preoccupied the minds of men. Indeed, within the continent of Africa, Despite the difficulties that we have had to go through, leadership has always been at the back of our mind. And one can go into history. One can go into the history of Africa before she was colonized. And one will remember whether you are talking about the Zulu of South Africa or you are talking about the Ovambo and the Ovimbundu of Angola or the Akan of Ghana, or the Yoruba of Nigeria, that the question of leadership has remained alive and well. Even when other civilization cross seas and oceans to come to this continent, and they enslaved us, there were leaders who rose. They may have been overwhelmed. Our kith and kin may have been taken from the shores of the continent of Africa, into other parts of the world, but we never stop leading. And when slavery lost its luster, and other civilizations once again sat in Berlin in 1884 and 1885, and divided our continent into what we now call the 55 countries of Africa, our leaders were never, ever lost. The leaders were there, and they were clear in their mind that one day we would regain our independence. And I remember so very vividly that even as those other civilizations abused and denigrated the African peoples, Africans never slept through the revolution. They were alive and well and clear that the freedom that had been taken away from them would be regained. I remember so very vividly, courtesy of history, when Africans in the far, in the far lands in the Caribbean were thinking about how they would come back to the mother continent to regain their dignity. I can remember the works of great Africans such as Marcus Garvey, I can remember. I can remember the great works of Africans such as Williams. I can remember. I can remember the great works of your own South African, Pixley Kaisa Kaseme, as early as 1906, saying, we shall regenerate Africa. I can remember. I can remember. I can remember the voices of great Africans in those early days. I can still hear, even as I stand here, 
the great words of Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah say, we shall write our own history. I can remember the words of Patrice Emery Lumumba saying, we shall regain our independence. I can remember the conviction of Nelson Holisa Samandela. I can remember the words of Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe reminding us that there is no, only one race, the human race. I can remember. And when I remember that, I remember throughout the ages that what has distinguished humanity is the question of leadership. Leaders who rise up, leaders who come up and sacrifice all and say to themselves that we shall indeed rise to ensure that our circumstances will change. You know, when we talk about leadership today, we must ask ourselves certain fundamental questions. Who is a leader? Because we live in a world today where there are men and women who by dint of occupation of public office think that they are leaders. But many of them are not. Many of them are misleaders. And there is no shortage of such men and women, both in this continent, in this country, and the rest of the world. And it is incumbent upon us to realize that when our circumstances have been captured by men and women who are merely pretending to be leaders, then we will never realize what we desire. And what we desire is that justice must be done for all. What we desire is that the promises that have been made to us throughout the ages must be fulfilled. What we desire is that our dignity as human beings must never be undermined. What we desire is that we must give meaning to the words of the carpenter of Nazareth, that we are not children of a lesser God. What we must desire is the recognition, and this has been recognized throughout the ages, that we must be our brother's keeper. What we must desire is to ensure that we live in a world where we are judged not by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. That is what we desire. And we are gathered here today, therefore, to remind ourselves that throughout the ages, men and women have always realized their potential when there was clarity in their mind. We cannot afford to be of two minds. You who read the Bible will remember certain iconic moments in the Bible when the leaders are called upon to lead and the led are called upon to provide leadership in their own way. When you go out today, I want you to remember the story of that man called Elijah. You remember him saying to the prophets of Baal, and telling them the time has come that we must choose in order to move in the right direction. And he calls all of them and he says, let us not be of two opinions. If God is God, worship God. And if Baal is Baal, is God, worship Baal. I am today telling you that when you want to be a leader, you must be able to recognize what direction you are going to face. You cannot afford to be a two mind. I can also remember... In the book of the prophet Joshua, which you are aware of, Joshua assembling all the hosts of Israel and asking them, choose you now whom you shall serve, whether you shall serve the Lord, the gods of our ancestors before we crossed the river, or you shall serve the gods of the Amorites in whose land we sojourn, or you shall serve the Lord as for me and my house we have chosen to serve the Lord. Today I'm telling you that we must make choices. We must make choices and make the right choices. And you know, when I listen to the reverend talking about those who ask him whether there is a distinction between being a pastor and being a person who is looking at the affairs of man, there is no distinction between church and politics. Church and politics are Siamese twins. Because the last time I checked, the divine instruction is that we must eat. And eating is a political issue. The last time I checked, 
I discover that we must have water and water is a political and a spiritual issue. The last time I checked, we must go to the toilet and that is a political issue and indeed also a biblical issue. The last time I checked, there is nothing that is in the Bible which is not a political question. It is therefore the duty of a pastor to be as political as politics can be. Because before we go to heaven, we must eat. Before we go to heaven, we, when we are sick, we must go to hospital. We must do that. So today, I'm, I'm, I'm here before you to remind every pastor, wherever they are, every man of God, that one of your greatest vocations is to be a politician. The question is, what kind of a politician? That is the only question. What kind of a politician? What kind of politics? Because there is politics and politics. And the politics that we are talking about is the politics that will liberate our countries and will liberate our minds. When I remember the history of this country, I can still remember during the dark days of apartheid, I remember the voice of Desmond Pilot Tutu bellowing from the pulpits and telling the architects of apartheid that we cannot delude ourselves by pretending that we are singing hallelujah while our kith and kin are being judged on the basis of the color of their skin. We must sing hallelujah in the recognition that our duty is to be our brother and sister's keeper. Was Desmond Pilo too to a man of God and a politician? He was both and he had to be both. I can still remember the voice of Alan Busak beaming from the pulpit and saying, Behold, we must fight the injustices. And I can still go and remember the voice of Christ himself telling those who are standing in the way of fairness and justice that it is incumbent upon us to be politicians. So today I'm inviting all of us to be politicians. I'm inviting all of us to be politicians because it is only when we are politicians who believe in certain virtues that we can liberate our countries. Because history has demonstrated not once, not twice, but times without number that when we abandon our political duties, when we are not devoted citizens, there is no shortage of men and women whose only desire is to devour us. It is our duty to stand in their way. It is our duty to deny them the oxygen that they need to survive. It is our duty to tell them unequivocally that we shall not allow you to run roughshod over us. It is our duty to remind them that you cannot normalize the absurd. It is our duty to remind them that they cannot be greedy to our detriment. It is our duty to remind them that we cannot allow ourselves to be led by men and women whose only claim to fame is that they are greedy beyond measure. It is our duty to remind them that we have a duty to make this world a good world for everybody else. It is our duty to remind them that whenever we have fought slavery, whenever we have fought colonization, whenever we fight neocolonization, whenever we have fought apartheid, we wanted our lives to be lived in a manner that was dignified. We must remind them. So today, we are here to remind ourselves that we must be leaders of ourselves. Because we have learned over the years that is only when you lead yourself, when you cleanse yourself, that you can be a good leader. You know, sometimes, and many are those times, when I read the story in the Bible, and I read about Jesus of Nazareth, and I wrap my mind about his humility, and I hear him many times saying that he did not come to be served, but he came to serve. Yes. Then I look at our leaders who, when they are seeking to serve us, and he's not only in South Africa, 
It is almost everywhere in the Bible. When they are seeking our support, they are humility personified. They kiss babies. <laughs> they go to the shebin. They drink from dirty cups. They walk on food. They smile with us. They take photos with everybody. They discard their security. They are humility personified. They speak the language that we want to hear. They do the thing that they think we want to see them do. They delude us. They cheat us. And somehow we accept that they are leaders. But immediately they get what they want. Oh, they have a reverse Pauline conversion. If they were Paul, they go back to being souls. And we can no longer recognize them. When you ring them, their phones are picked by somebody called a PA, whose only claim to fame that he is rude beyond measure. When you go to the officers, when you go to the officers, they no longer want to see you. When they are driving in the streets, their sirens scare you. While I suspect that those who discovered the siren meant that it should be used for good purposes. For them it is a badge of honor. And they harass us in the streets. They acquire things which they have not worked for. They want to be described as honorable even when they are horrible. These are the men that we have. And there is no shortage of such men and women in the African continent. They promise us things that they know they will never deliver. And we believe them. I am today telling us that a devoted citizen must have eyes that can see such individuals. Because who is a devoted citizen? A devoted citizen is a citizen who is aware of his or her circumstances. A devoted citizen is a citizen who is going to sacrifice for the sake of this generation and generations yet to be born. This country has had devoted citizens. Nelson Mandela was such a devoted citizen. Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe was such a devoted citizen. Chris Hani was such a devoted citizen. And I know that there are many others who are devoted, devoted citizens. Winnie Madikezela Mandela was such a devoted citizen. Albertina Sisulu was such a devoted citizen. And many Tirongoposte was such a devoted citizen. There has been no shortage of devoted citizens in this country, both known and unknown. And that is why this country is iconic. I remember when I talk about devoted citizen when I was a young graduate, when I was a young high school student, even when I was a primary school student, I remember history teaching me about the Sharpville massacre when men and women came out and they feared nothing and they were prepared to die and some of them died that you may leave. I remember in 1976, young primary school children dying that you may leave. I remember many great South Africans spending their time in jail, suffering that you may leave. The question now, are you devoted citizens? Or you have become champagne revolutionaries, <laughs> whose only claim to fame is that you want to eat bacon in the morning, and to have, have caviar at lunchtime, and to have lamb chops in the evening, and punctuate it with wine, and then you say, behold, I'm a revolutionary. That is not revolution. Revolution is about recognizing what must be done, and that it must be done with devotion, and it must be done consistently, and it must be done in a manner that is going to save the continent of Africa. That is what we are talking about. That is how I understand it. And I, I am of the view that this country and this continent must do it. 
Today, many times when I think about my continent, this continent of Africa, this mother continent, this continent that is the cradle of human civilization, this continent that has known abuse by the slavers, this continent that has been colonized, this continent that has known neocolonization, this continent that has known apartheid, this continent that is the home of all minerals known to man, this continent that is the home of rivers that produce waters, this continent that has over 1.4 billion, this continent which is great in prospect, but this continent which is at the lower rungs of the ladder, this continent I think of her, where are our leaders? How can it be that in the 1940s we fought that we may drive out the colonizer and the colonizer is coming back again? How can it be? How can it be that 60 years ago we regained our independence and our young men and women are now fighting to go to the land of the colonizers? How can it be? How can it be that 28 years ago you slew the giant that was appetite, but there is still appetite of an economic kind? How can it be? How can it be? And how can it be that we are comfortable in that environment? How can it be? It cannot be right. How can we claim that we are devoted citizens when those realities confront us on a daily basis? How can it be? I hear cries across the continent of Africa. I hear cries from Dakar in Senegal. They're asking, how can it be that we cannot feed ourselves, they're asking in Dakar. They're asking in the Gambia, how can it be? The same question is asked in Sierra Leone, in Burkina Faso, in Mali, in Benin, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Sudan, in South Sudan, in Somalia, in Mozambique, in Botswana, in Lesotho, in Eswatini, in South Africa. They're asking, how can it be? How can it be that every other civilization comes to our continent and takes away that which they desire and leave us in deprivation, they ask. They are asking, how can the world order be of such a nature that the French can come here and do what they will and go away without consequence? They are asking, how can the British come here and do what they will and live without consequence. They are asking, how is it that the Americans can come here and do what they will and live without consequence? They are asking, how can the Turks come here? How can the Arabs come here? Do what they will and live without consequence. Are they asking, why? How can the Chinese come here? And they do what they will and live without consequence. Uh, they are asking, how is it that the world order is arranged? that when we of the African continent appear in world bodies, whether it's the WHO, we have no vaccines when we are sick. When we appear at the United Nations, we can vote all we want, but a single European country can veto all our votes and neutralize us, giving meaning to the unfortunate situation that we are indeed lesser human beings. How can it be? that when they meet at G7 and decide for us we are not there unless we are invited for a photo opportunity. <laughs> when they meet at G20, we are not there unless we are invited for a photo opportunity. How can it be? How can it be? Where are our leaders, we ask? How can it be? Where are our leaders in all these? What are they doing about it? What are we doing about it? What must we do about it? Why is it that we have leaders and we cannot feed ourselves because there is a war in Ukraine? 
How can it be? How can it be that when we have COVID, the claim to fame of our political leaders is that they become multimillionaires and we don't have vaccines? How can it be? How can it be that we have hostels and all equipment is imported from other civilizations? How can it be? How can it be that we have schools in which we have no faith? How can it be that even our airlines fly aeroplanes that are made by other civilizations? And we cannot even run them. How can it be that a matter that is not rocket science, such as the provision of electricity, whether you are in Johannesburg in South Africa, or Abuja in Nigeria, or Accra in Ghana, or Nairobi in Kenya, or Bujumbura, or Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso, we cannot provide electricity for our men and women. How can it be? How can it be that we have all the 33 currencies in the world with the rand, with the medical, with the shilling, with the naira, with the CD, with all dollars, and those currencies mean nothing. The only currency that we accept as hard currency is the American dollar. How can it be? How can it be that when I travel to Africa, the only credit cards that I have are the Visa and the MasterCard and the American Express and that we have no card of our own? How can it be? How can it be that today when I am traveling across Africa and yet we have leaders, when I'm in Nairobi, Kenya, or in Kampala, Uganda, when I go to a supermarket, there is no supermarket that is our own. I buy from Carrefour, which is French. And when I bought something from Carrefour, which is French, and I bought Kenchik, which is American, and when I want to move, I move in Uber, which is American, or Bolt, which is Estonian. And when I want it to be delivered to my house, it is delivered to me by Glovo, which is Spanish. And when I want my house to be guarded, it is by Gada World, which is Canadian. Where are our leaders? These are the questions that I'm asking. How can we possibly be comfortable in such a situation? How can it be that in many African countries the unemployment rate is anything between 35 and 80 percent? Our young men and women are graduating from institutions but they have nowhere to go. How can it be? Because we are exporting all our jobs. How can it be today that all our manufacturing is happening in China? When I want a flask, the Chinese give it to me. When I want pepper, the Chinese give it to me. When I want a pen, the Chinese give it to me. When I want a pencil, the Chinese give it to me. And when I want shoes, the Italians give it to me. When I want shirts, the Belgians give it to me. When I want watches, the Swiss give it to me. When I want water, the Americans give me Darsani. When I want a cold drink, the Americans give me Coca-Cola. What has happened to us? These are issues that we must wrap our minds around because history has demonstrated times without number that she is only capable of aiding those who are willing to work. I remember that day, courtesy of history. I remember that encounter between Moses and God himself. And I remember Moses walking into the mountain of God and I remember him lamenting and saying, now that you are sending me to the Israelites, what shall I do? And I remember God telling him, and what do you have in your hand? 
and he says this is the only thing that I have in my hand and he says it is that by that rod and staff that you shall liberate the Israelites today as we talk about the devoted citizen I hear God asking us what do you have in your hand God is asking you, what do you have in your hand? What character do you have that you can use to part the Red Seas that are facing us? What do you have in your hand that you can strike the rocks that water may come out? That is the question that is personal to you. Because when you go out of here, you will be asking yourself, what is it that you can do to change your circumstances? And the last time I checked, there is not going to be a nuclear solution to our problems. It is going to be block by block. It is going to be city by city. It is going to be slow and painful. And history has demonstrated that when it is done in that way, then it can last. It is not lost on me that there will be signs and there will be times of pain and sorrow when a forward movement looks like a backward movement. But movement, it must be. You know, I remember the great Martin Luther King Jr. talking about leadership and service. And I remember him saying, not in so many words, that when it falls upon your laps to sip the streets, sip the streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. <laughs> sip the streets like Mozart composed music. Perhaps if he was in Africa, he would have said, sip the streets like Lucky Dube composed music. Sip the streets like Femi Anikulapokuti composed music. I'm now saying that leadership is leadership everywhere. You know, I remember, because my memory still serves me well. I remember in 1982, I was watching a movie which I commend to all of you. The movie Mahatma Gandhi by Sir Richard Attenborough. And I remember, and I invite you to remember with me, one day, the Mahatma goes to his ashram, and he walks into the toilet and he discovers that the toilet has not been cleaned. And he asks his wife, why has the toilet not been cleaned? And it was your turn to clean the toilet. And the wife tells him, how can I clean the toilet? And there are workers to do it. And the Mahatma tells her, it is all the more reason that you must clean the toilet because that is true service. Tells him that when all is said and done, Perhaps the greatest person in that assembly was the toilet cleaner. I'm urging you that when it falls upon your lap to clean the toilet, clean the toilet so clean that people will say, Behold, a great toilet cleaner. When it falls upon your lap to be a musician, sing so well that it may be said of you, You are a great singer. Because that is leadership. Leadership is at all levels. Today, we think that leadership is only political leadership, but many of those individuals who are in the political arena are truly quite a number of them. There are few good ones, but many of them are con men and con women. And it's our duty to expose them for who they are. You know, sometimes I look at us in Africa, And I ask, courtesy of democracy, we are given the opportunity to vote. And the men and women who want us to vote come to us, seeking our mandate that they may serve us. And they tell us many things. And we believe the things that they tell us. And we vote them into office. And once we vote them into office, we assume that they'll deliver to us. And we go back to sleep. We expect them to preside over the building of our roads. 
In South Africa, at least don't complain about roads. You have better roads than most of Africa. So let us give credit where credit is due. <laughs> but you will tell me you are comparing us with not so good countries, but on the road sector you are doing reasonably well. In other African countries, they don't even do the roads, but they build bridges where there are no rivers. <laughs> then we expect them to do our hostels, and they don't do so. I'm urging us today that as a devoted citizen, it is your duty to remain eternally vigilant because history has demonstrated to us that it is only through eternal vigilance that good things are retained and maintained and sustained. <laughs> Let us also remember that all that we do as devoted citizens are intergenerational. We are the young men and women singing we must remember that our duty as devoted citizens is to run our baton. Life is a relay race. You know, history teaches me a lot of things, and I want history to teach you many things. On the sixth day of March, the year 1997, a great African was invited to Accra, Ghana, in the same manner that I'm, I, I'm invited here. That great African was a great Tanzanian Mwalimu Kambarage Nyerere. And when he was invited, he did not have a written speech, but on that day he said he was going to talk about unity. And he spoke and said, we are gathered here 40 years after Ghana regained our independence. And when we are gathered in that manner, we must ask ourselves certain fundamental questions. What have we done with our independence? And he reminded us that when we were seeking independence, we promised ourselves many things. We promised ourselves that we would fight poverty. We promised ourselves that we would fight ignorance and disease. Let us take stock. Have we eliminated poverty? No, we have not, he said. Have we eliminated ignorance? No, we have not. Have we eliminated disease? No, we have not. But let us be fair, he said to the generation to which I belong. We have run our race. We may have made mistakes. This generation must now ask itself, what can they do to build on what we started? And he said, in the process of trying to do what we promised ourselves, there are many mistakes that may have been made, and we have made our fair share of mistakes. But what mistake we must never make is the mistake of giving up. We must never make the mistake of giving up. We must always say that it can be done, and it must be done, because if it is not done, then we ourselves will be done. Today, I'm telling us, that we have the wherewithal to do it. Sometimes we lament too much. Sometimes we complain too much. Sometimes we quarrel too much. Sometimes we blame too much. Sometimes we think that it's all lost. But I want to tell you that in the struggle for that which is good, there'll be moments of desperation. There'll be moments when you want to give up. There'll be moments when you want to say that it cannot be done. But depression, if it does not become clinical, is useful because it gives you a moment of useful reflection. So today I'm asking you to remember that it can be done and you are the people who can do it. For the younger generation, I am asking you to remember these immortal words of Chinua Achebe of Nigeria. He asked at one moment in a gathering such as this, and where are the young suckers that will grow when the old banana dies? Today I'm happy that I can see the, old, the young suckers that will grow when the old banana dies. And to the young people, I'm also telling you that we must never make the mistake 
of rubbishing the legacy of those who lived before you. They will have made mistakes, but your duty is to correct those mistakes. Your duty is to look at the foundation stones that they built and build and correct because none of us is without fault. It is our duty, therefore, to go out there. It is our duty on an occasion such as this when we are asking how we devoted students to ask ourselves what our ancestors would say today. I am asking you today, you who are South Africans, when Nelson Mandela is up there in heaven, I assume, And even, and he's looking down upon South Africa. What questions are Nelson Mandela asking? What questions is he asking? And I hear him asking all South Africans, irrespective of race. When I was here in 1994, when I walked out of prison, did I not say that I've forgiven all of you? He's asking, have we forgiven one another? I hear Nelson Mandela asking, did I not fight that we may have justice? And he's asking, is justice with you today? I hear Nelson Mandela asking, did we not gain independence that our young men and women should be employed? And he is asking, are they employed? I hear Nelson Mandela asking. I hear Nelson Mandela asking, why are you killing yourself in the taverns? I hear him asking. I hear Nelson Mandela asking, was it not the divine instruction that you should be your brother's keeper? Why is rape rampant in this country? I hear Nelson Mandela asking. And he's not the only one who is asking. I hear Robert Mangalisa Sobukwe asking. I hear Chris Hani asking. I hear Winnie Madikezela Mandela asking. They are asking you these questions and I want you to give me an answer. Give me an answer. Are they asking in vain? Could it be that they are asking and saying it was better while we waited? Do you want them to say that it was better while we waited? They are charging us. Those questions should not depress us, but they should energize us. They should tell us that there is work yet to be done. So today, fellow Africans, we are assembled here because we want to be devoted citizens. We are assembled here in a sanctuary where the word of God is spoken every so often. And I feel the spirit telling us that something must be done that when you leave here today, it must never be the same again. You know, when I look at the ministry of Christ, when he had been crucified, and the apostles who are with him, each one of them went their way. Each one of them. It was a lost cause, so they thought. But something happened on the journey to a mouse. And then they were assembled as we are here. And then I read, and I read right, that the Holy Spirit visited them, and they spoke in tongues. May it be that there is a Holy Spirit that is visiting you. And I'm very specific in saying that the Spirit should be holy, because there is no shortage of other spirits. Because you may be possessed, but you may be possessed with the spirit of greed. You may be possessed with the spirit of corruption. You may be possessed with the spirit of racism. 
you may be possessed with the spirit of danger i am asking you to embrace the holy spirit because the holy spirit tells us that you must only do that which is good and right the holy spirit tells us that you must not be greedy the holy spirit tells us that there is only one race the human race the holy spirit tells us that it is not by the creed of greed that you must live but by the creed of god the holy spirit tells me so let the holy spirit come here that you may go out into the society and change the society you go out there individually go out there and do that which is good and right may god bless you nobody was looting anything they simply said we are getting it done and it can't be done do i see that something like that happening in africa yes we must never forget that you begin to see people doing that i saw in ghana they were raising those issues i saw in different african countries people are beginning to ask questions in in different fora even the social media yeah. but the social media has its own limitation there is no virtual demonstration if you demonstrate virtually who cares you can do <laughs> there must be Online. boots on the ground yeah. thank you <laughs> <laughs> I think I also need to bring a balance as well, especially in South Africa when it comes to leadership in the church. Mm -hmm. I always say to people, if in your church you are the only one successful as a leader, yes. mm -hmm. and everybody that, everyone that you are leading, they're in poverty, there's something wrong with yeah. you. I think that's a problem that we have mm -hmm. in the leadership in this country, both in the church and also in the politics yeah, yeah. you find a guy who is a president it is only in his heart yeah. in his house where there are where there's lights the neighbors nothing it yeah, is only him yeah. and he's just enjoying the benefits of leadership yeah. but he is not making an impact in the lives of people mm. how i define leadership is that leadership must better the lives of people mm -hmm. unfortunately in africa most of the pastors if i can say when they die the very same thing that they've built yeah. also dies yeah. mm -hmm. because everything revolves around them yeah. we build in ourselves mm -hmm. that is the problem of this country mm -hmm. if we can lead with the future generation in mind mm -hmm. we are going to make an impact in this nation Correct. and we're going to bless the next generation mm -hmm. Well said, Thank you. well put, well put. Another common question that is uh, repeatedly being asked is around a country just next door to South Africa, Zimbabwe. Um, Robert Mugabe was known probably as one of the most um, revolutionary leaders in, in Africa. After gaining independence in 1980, he, he led his country to a point that it became the breadbasket of Africa. But fast forward to 2022, Everybody knows what's happening there. He grabbed land from where he thought it should be taken from. So the question here is that what, what, how can we use the Robert Mugabe route without necessarily ending up where we are? Land is a big issue in Africa. People want land, but how can they do it in a way that is not destructive? You know, let, let us, uh, the situation in Zimbabwe must also be understood in context. Because when the Smith regime was driven away during the negotiations in Lancaster, the British undertook to finance the transfer of land to the black majority. They reneged on that promise. And, and Mugabe's administration actually had a waiting period. And Mugabe was laboring under pressure. You, you fought independence on the basis that you would redistribute land the people who promised to give you money have reneged on it. What do you do? And the Mugabe administration was acting in desperation. And, and, and therefore, a number of mistakes were made. If, if, for example, you give me a parcel of land of 2,000 acres, I don't know what to do with it. And that is what happened. But as to whether there was a case for redistribution of land, that can never be denied. That, in my view, can never be denied. Mistakes were made, 
and they were made in a manner that undermined agriculture in Zimbabwe. The question now to be asked, how do we repair the mistakes that were made so that we restore production to the level that they were and even make them better? And South Africa is now in a better situation. Knowing as you do, having watched the Zimbabwean situation, you must ask yourself the question, is it tenable? that a small minority of the population should hold 72% of the land? It is not. You cannot rationalize it. And the sooner that is realized, the better. In my view, South Africa has an opportunity in a programmatic manner by involving all stakeholders to redistribute land because land is the last colonial question. And if you don't solve the problem of land now, you are merely postponing it. And you are postponing it to the detriment of the country. So my view is it is incumbent upon, in fact, it is too late in the day. There should be program. I know my good friend, my man is here and is a politician and others. This is the time for the government to move with jet-like speed to begin engaging in the redistribution. No doubt in my mind. And, 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 and very lastly, it must be done in, in, in a manner that does not undermine agriculture. And it can be done. If, if for example, you want to redistribute 14,000 acres of land, what prevents government to train people? What prevents government to create cooperatives? What prevents government to incorporate companies where people buy shares and then to have that owned in a manner that does not disrupt industry, does not disrupt agriculture. So let us always uh, look at circumstances in the context of history. And I can give the example of Kenya. In Kenya, when we regained independence, the same British colonizer did enter into an arrangement for redistribution of land, and they actually did give some money. Although they didn't do it very well, we still have a land problem, but at least they did not behave the manner in which they behaved towards Zimbabwe. And, and, and I think that there are lessons to be drawn. In, in, in Kiswahili, which I'm now taught, I'm told is taught in South Africa, there is a saying which say, goes like this. When your neighbor is being shaved, put, hair, put water on your hair because you are the next one to be shaved. So, so you, you, you saw what was happening in Zimbabwe, you in South Africa, and not only in South Africa, even in Namibia. We don't talk about Namibia as often as we should, but even Namibia faces that kind of scenario. And I believe that there are men and women of goodwill who want to see you uh, a rainbow country. You will only retain your rainbowness if you behave in a rainbow manner. I'll stick to my lane. <laughs> actually, I like the way you concluded your answer because the next question actually picks up from what you've, you've just um, uh, alluded to. So someone here says, thoughts on leadership for, racially for a racially divided country and creating national unity or common purpose for a diverse people. So basically the question is, how do you lead a nation which is racially divided, divided and that deeply seated you know, challenges in terms of history and how communities have interrelated? How can one lead effectively to have the rainbow nation that you, you referred to? No easy answers to questions such as those. One, no easy answers. But the truth is that, and, and when I read Nelson Mandela, when I try to understand or, or Artambo, who was out of the country for a long time, when I read uh, the, the poem by, uh, by Tabumbeki, I am an African, when I listen to uh, Mangaliso Subukwe, they are saying, we, are, we have found ourselves in a historical situation which we must address. How do we address it? And I think in 1994, the leaders of South Africa made a conscious decision that we live in a country which is multi-ethnic, multi-racial. And when you live in such a situation, you then have to give and take. And you, 
you have given and have taken. Look at your own national anthem. There is no other anthem in the world like that. None. None. But you chose that path. You then chose the path of recognizing different languages as official languages. Occasionally, I, I, I listen to and sometimes enjoy the drama in your parliament. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and one could be speaking in, in African, then in English, then in Isizulu. No other parliament, national parliament in the world. How do you go forward? You know, you can have all those things, but as long as economic inequalities exist, that is the game changer. From where I sit, that is the game changer. If there are inequalities, then people remember. People ask, but we killed apartheid. But have our circumstances changed? And those are the questions that we must eliminate. How do we eliminate them? by engaging in programs that create opportunities for all. Is it something that can be done in a five years, in 10 years? No, it's not. It is something that will be done over a period of time. And people want to see conscious decisions being made and decisions being implemented. The reason why people get impatient is to think that those, particularly the black leaders, people are impatient with their black leaders they are saying, but we thought we would be doing something, but your greatest claim to fame now is theft. Is theft. Somebody owns money which is ill-gotten, which could, could, could actually upgrade a slum area, could upgrade an informal settlement. Sure, These are yeah. the things that we are talking about. So in my view, if the leaders were to be conscious and say we want to serve, I was listening, all of us who are keen about Africa were listening to the Zondo report and the, 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 lib the liberations. Look at the amount of money involved and that is just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. That is just the tip of the iceberg. If you conducted a lifestyle audit on those who are political leaders and bureaucrats in across South Africa in May, you'd be shocked. Perhaps nearly anything up to 30% of the GDP is in private hands. You, if you are to release that money into the communities in different parts of South Africa, that is how you begin to build the rainbow nation. A rainbow nation where people don't, are not desperate economically. Economic desperation. Let me, let me tell you as a Christian, we are Christians here. You know, I am, I, I, sometimes I try to understand Christ when, when, when I'm alone. Just try to understand it. <laughs> this is the Son of God, and, and He knows. He says, man shall not live by bread alone. Yeah. Which means he needs bread. But he cannot live with it alone. Yeah. So when he goes into a crowd, he, he feeds the fellows. Because he knows that when you are hungry, even the spirit becomes weak. So if you have no job yeah. and you are telling us to be united to love your neighbor, yeah. how can you love your neighbor who is eating caviar and you have not eaten? <laughs> so without belaboring the issue, let us not even love goes beyond a certain point of elasticity. Yeah. And, 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 you will see as individuals, when, when you have money in your pocket, if you become a lot more courageous. I don't know whether you feel this. You, you are a lot more courageous. You, you, you don't mind if you pass next to a McDonald's. But if you have no money, you generally look for a, a sheep in where you'll consume umkombo. <laughs> so, in a nutshell, economic inequality is something that must be addressed. And, and I conclude by saying, even our young men and women who are crossing the Mediterranean, if you ask, why are they running? Yeah. It's because there are no opportunities at home. Is it that we can't create opportunities at home? We can create them. But those in positions of leadership are not doing, they are selling us short. Yeah. And this is what, in fact, the very reason that we are assembled here 
when we are looking at devoted citizens, when I look at the clip of, of, of Pastor Matebula here, you are, what you are doing distributed, that is not, in, in a proper situation, that should not be your work. Whenever you are doing that, it means that some government department has failed. It has failed. And, and, and indeed, if you go to their budget, it could very well be true that there is money allocated for what we are doing. So these are the things that we are talking about, but as, as, as all of us know, it is not easy, it is not for the faint-hearted, we must talk about them, we must play our part, because lamentation without action. For example here, the beauty of this assembly here is that we are lamenting, we are criticizing, but we are doing something in our own corner, because if you are asked, what are you doing? Say, yeah. yes, this is what we are doing. Yeah. We are also making a contribution, but you have a larger duty, you have a budget, you have taxpayers' money to use, but where are you taking the taxpayers? You are building uh, and uh, buying an apartment in Dubai and Mauritius and seashells? Thank you, thank you. Um, you don't have to ask me no, anything. We ask him. There is actually a question. There are a few questions that have come through, and yeah. I'll, I'll summarize yeah. for you um, in terms of the role of the church. So the question here is around the fact that how can the church be a trusted partner in changing the status quo that you so eloquently spoke about this morning? How can we trust the church given the mushrooming of charlatans, if I may call them that, in the body of Christ, who are reaping the hard-earned cash of poor people by brainwashing them, and then they turn around and they say they are men and women of God. How can the church be a trusted partner? You know, that is that a question. For me? You let, can let, let, me, let me answer it first as a member of the laity. By their fruits, you shall know them. By their fruits. By their fruits. And today, it cannot be denied that there is no shortage of charlatans masquerading as men and women of God. By their fruits, you shall know them. And, 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 and we, you can see if, if you have a situation where people are using the word of God for personal benefit to the detriment of the community, sooner rather than later, they will be punished. And I'm saying that sometimes we, the word church is used very loosely. Who is the church? It is us. It is us. The church is us. Sometimes we think that the church are the clergy. The clergy and us make the church. This, this thing is not a church. This, this building, this thing could be a casino. If, if we bring machining rooms, this, this, this could be a, a tavern. It is us worshipping God that make it a church. So, so... And, and you remember on that day that Christ said that you have converted my father's house into a different thing. So my own view is, if you look at the church, and there is, the, you are not going, in fact, if you look at Paul's second letter to Timothy at chapter 3, which I advised you to read, he says, in the last days, there will be a form of Christianity where people will be lovers of themselves. These are those last days. But just as Janus and Jambres disturbed Moses in the desert, it will happen to us, but our discerning spirit should tell us what is right and wrong. So I am saying, as I conclude, that the church, we, the church, we, the church, we are relevant because we cannot live our lives in compartments. There is, when, and, and when people say that the church should not be involved in politics, they are telling the citizens who are Christian, don't involve yourself in politics. How yeah. can it happen? Yeah. We cannot because our life is a totality of our civic duties which constitute our very being. 
what we are saying is that when you are a member of the church, it should be self-evident. When you are driving, when you are in an office, sometimes, you see somebody, there are people who may tell you, I'm born again, and say, Bo are you born again? <laughs> because your activities and the activities of those who are born again are worlds apart. So my view, we as the church, and I think we should now begin to change our understanding of the church. I'm very, the clergy are not the church. It is us. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised in quite a number of this congregation that we attend, that on the day of judgment, you'll see your pastor going to hell and you are going to heaven. <laughs> yes. It is quite possible. And the, and the reason is simple. Because he was preaching the word of God, you followed the word of God, but he preached or she preached but did not believe. So we, the church, have a duty to make a contribution. Thank you very much. Sibu, I don't have to add much on that. I'm glad that it came from Prof. What has been worrying me, uh, troubling me for years, is to see the Church of Jesus taking a back seat. You know, all this that we are doing here, I think it is that call that we want to give it to the people, to say, church, it is time now. Mm. It is time now. Mm. We cry for a great leadership, and it has always troubled me. You go to our churches, any church in South Africa, there's excellence. Mm. Look at the excellence that is here. But what has been troubling me, you don't see this excellence in our community. Mm. You have a church like this, but on the street, just over the street, the, the, the grass, the weeds all over. And I'm saying the excellence only remains within the walls of the church. Does this please God? We need to take this thing out of this building and become the salt and the light of the world. And that's it. So Prof has said much on that. I think he was spot on. But for me, that is where we are. And I'm still saying it to the pastors. That is why without, you know, attacking anybody. But it always troubled me to park a seven series next to a tent. Hmm. Yeah. I always had a problem with that. And I said to the, those who were close to me, I said, build first. Hmm. Yeah. Let the seven series or Mercedes Benz come later. Yeah. Because people misinterpret this thing of pastoring. Mm. It's like a pastor is a Mercedes Benz, you know, and a tent. Mm. Yet the people are not impacted. Mm. It's more about the lives of people. Mm. Jesus says, I have come so that they may have life. Mm. A life in abundance. Yeah. One translation says, life overflowing. Mm. Now, something that is overflowing, watch this. If I am holding a cup here of glass, a glass, and I'm pouring water, and that water will overflow, and then will actually come to the floor. If I keep on pouring, the water will leave this floor, mm. go through the doors. If I keep on pouring, the water will go through the doors into the streets. Something that is overflowing must leave the doors of the building, must go to the streets in our community, must impact South Africa. Mm. Why should we keep this to ourselves? So we need to impact. So I strongly believe the church of Jesus must actually do that. But I'm so excited to say that COVID has made the church to be real. Mm. That is why I'm so confident yeah. come 2024, you know, South Africa will never be the same because of these people who are here. Unfortunately, yeah. our time. Yeah, yeah yeah our time is really running out and i think maybe as the last question i felt let's let's include the young people because there is a question actually that uh, addresses some of their issues considering the amount of mistakes that need to be corrected how can young people begin to address the mistakes leveraging on the resources and the tools such as technology that we currently have so how can the youth shift and catapult us into a, a brighter future as a continent and as a country. 
I hold the view that the younger generation is in a better position than the older generation. Technology gives us the opportunity to leapfrog uh, some of the nations that were ahead of us in terms of development. And I think training of young people in a proper manner is something that is very cr critical. Technology is a double-edged sword. It depends on how you use it. If you use it negatively, then it will have a negative impact. You can spend all your time on Twitter or Instagram or all these other media very negatively. But you can also expand that energy in a very positive way. And that is where training comes in. It is the duty of the older generation to train young men and women in a manner that will help them use the tools at their disposal in a positive manner. And that is why we must have a, a positive influence. There is an Igbo saying from Nigeria, it says that when mother cow is chewing, baby cow looks and emulates. So if we conduct ourselves in a proper manner, then the younger generation will also conduct themselves in a proper manner. And we must also be modest enough to make them know that we are not infallible. Yeah. You know, if you make them know that you are not infallible, you make them know that we made mistakes, then they'll avoid the landmines which we stepped on. And I think that is the duty of each one of us. And this must not only be the responsibility of government. It must start from the house. What are we doing in our households? How are we mentoring our young men and women? How are we uh, mentoring our young men and women in schools? How are we mentoring them in churches, in mosques, in synagogues? I think it is, uh, it is an African reality that a child is a child of the community. Yeah. And if a child is a child, child of the community, it means that it is the duty of the community to rebuke yeah. the child and to correct the child. I have great faith in African youth. But my faith is guarded. It's guarded because the world is also full of many negative attractions from which they must be protected. It is our duty to do so and to do so consistently and to do so vigilantly. I want to conclude by giving a few examples. You know, during our lifetime, most of us, we have seen this country called China. Say anything you want to say about China. Yeah. But there is something that they have done that is amazing. It used to be the case that if you had a poor quality product, it came from China. Today, China gives you what you want. If you want poor quality, they give you. If you want the best quality, they give you. They, 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 they have a menu, they have, they have a buffet of products, and you choose. But in our lifetime, the Chinese have grown, and we can see it. There is something to learn from, China, from the Chinese. I see in the streets of Africa, and there are many of them. They are work ethic. They are work ethic. They are disciplined. Even when they are eating, it is in small bowls. You and me will be eating pap, a huge pap. <laughs> but them small bowls, they, they, they work like bees. That is something to be emulated. Look at the Koreans, the South Koreans, how they work. And, and, and the, the beauty of the global world is that it gives you the opportunity to see how others are doing their things. You accept the things that are positive and reject the things that are negative. And I think that is what we should do as Africans. Is in, within the continent of Africa, I'm not saying that we are doing things that are not good. Many of our things are not being well done, particularly in the political class. But we can do things. And our young people have the capacity to do. And we learn these things. And let me tell you, when I was younger, I thought I could change the world. I now know better. <laughs> I now know better. And what do I know? that I only make my contribution. Yeah. We make your contribution a positive contribution. And that is all I do. And, and when you make your contribution, that is how the world changes. You know, Mahatma Gandhi at one time was asked, 
but there is so much iniquity in the world. He said, yes, it is an imperfect world. There will always be iniquity. But do you condemn the ocean because one bubble is dirty? No, you don't. Mother Teresa, whom you, Miss Matabula, talked about, once said, if you go into a dark room and you find it dark, you can complain all you want, but there is another choice. Light a candle. And let your neighbor light a candle. And lo and behold, the light will conquer the darkness. So I'm urging us, you young people, be the single candle that it may be said of you that amidst the gloom, you are the glitter. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Prof. As I think that is where I want to appeal to all business people, all leaders here. I don't believe that God has blessed you with those millions so that you can just wake up in the morning and look at that account and say, <laughs> <laughs> There are many young people who would need you to empower them. Yeah. Let me tell you about my story in closing. I ran away from home at the age of 10. I was in the streets of Johannesburg for five years, living like a hobo, like a hobo. I would just try to get anything just to eat, smoking glue. A woman picked me up at the age of 15 and said, you know what? I'm going to take you to school. I will just build your life and you can become something. At the age of 22, I did not even pass my trick. They actually made me to pass. <laughs> and, but she believed in me. She believed in me. May her soul rest in peace. Mm. Look what the Lord has done today. Yeah. I'm a family man today. I'm a pastor of the church. I'm a pastor in the community. Just because of somebody who saw something in me. Mm. I am asking you, do that for somebody else. Mm. There's those kids out there, those young people out there, you'd never know. Just the 500 rand of a school uniform mm. yeah. to say, go to school. I may not do everything for you. It will go a long way. We know what is happening in this country. So that is my request. Mm. And then to all the leaders and all of you who have been blessed by God, mm. let us bring a change into this nation. Thank and I'll close with those words. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe in closing, this is not a question. It's a remark. It's a request. Somebody says here, Prof for president of Africa. <laughs> and um, Thank you. another person says, will you open a leadership school for Africans? They want to be the first one to enroll. Yeah, yeah. Asante sana, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.